My name is Jennifer Boggett and I'm an occupational therapist who's been working at CHEO in outpatient mental health for about 19 years. And this presentation is a small overview of some of the things that I've learned during this time as I've worked with kids and adolescents on self-regulation. So what is self-regulation? I have gone over many, many different definitions of this and I've come to one by another occupational therapist, Kim Bartell, and it is Self-regulation is the ability to feel my feelings, express my feelings, and then take care of my feelings. And we like to talk about it this way because we want, when it comes to self-regulation, we want to be able to identify what the feeling is. Self-regulating before bedtime can look very different than self-regulating before a presentation or self-regulating before you play a basketball game. So we wanna be able to know what am I doing, what am I feeling, and what is it, where am I trying to get to? Okay, so what self-regulation isn't is self-control. If we just focus on self-control, that often involves masking or hiding what we're actually feeling. So if a kid doesn't learn how to regulate or take control of their feelings, be able to, to label it and manage and express it, they will often avoid things so that they don't feel it or they will mask what they're feeling, they will shut down. When we are just controlling ourselves, we don't have access to higher thinking or problem solving. So regulating actually helps us to then connect with people and then be able to think more clearly and to problem solve better, which is ultimately what we want our kids to be able to do. So I'm going to show a few ways of um, illustrating why we want to self-regulate. So the first visual here is the neurosequential model by Dr. Bruce Perry. And it shows that it, from, the from the bottom up, how our brain works and how we get to the point where we can problem solve and learn and, and interact with people. So until a person is regulated, feeling physically and emotionally settled at the bottom there, they are unlikely to be able to relate or connect with you. And that's being connected and comfortable and having a trusting relationship. And until a kid can feel connected and comfortable, they're unlikely to have the mental capacity to be able to engage with you and to be able to talk and problem solve. So this is, and this is critical for problem solving to be able to get to that higher level of thinking. So like we want them to be able to perspective take or predict what might happen in the future. And if we think about when we're asking kids to, to regulate, it's when they're really upset about something and we want them to, what might happen if you kick your brother? What might happen um, if you break your iPad? We want them to be thinking about the future, predicting things. If the child is not regulated and not feeling connected, they're not going to actually be able to think of any of those things. I'm now going to show you a video on Dan Siegel's flip the lid model of the brain. And I like this one because I, I think visually and when I am interacting with my own family or I'm thinking about myself, having the visual of what happens to our brain when we are becoming dysregulated can be very helpful. Okay, so as you can see there, when we are dysregulated, we flip our lid and we do not have access to the higher thinking parts of our brain. This can be really helpful to share with your child or your adolescent so that they understand what's happening with them as well when they become upset or dysregulated. And for parents, we can often look at behaviors and tell kids they need to use a strategy so that they're not doing what we want them to do. And some of the behaviors might be yelling, they might be swearing, they might be throwing things, they might be refusing to talk. And this visual here shows that often behaviors are a stress response and they often fall into the fight, flight or freeze responses. And you can see there what a stress response in kids might look like. So if our child is, is, is showing any of these behaviors, it could be giving us information that they are in a stressed state, which means if we think about the, the, the visual, they are not regulated and they're not feeling connected. So asking them when they're doing these things to make a good choice, to think about what they're doing, to, to use a strategy, we are likely going to make things worse because they do not have access to the higher thinking of their brain. So most of my video today is going to be about co-regulation because co-regulation is the key to teaching our kids how to self-regulate. Our ultimate goal would be that, that we would want people to have the tools within themselves to know their feelings, take care of their feelings. But in order to do that, we need to help them learn. There isn't really a timeline for when this happens. Some kids 
It happens quickly, it happens easily, and we don't have to do a lot of scaffolding or teaching. And for some kids, they need more scaffolding and teaching. So I really stay away from the what should we expect at what ages, because if it's not there, it's not there. And if it's expected at a certain age and it's not there, it doesn't really matter what the age is, it matters that we need to teach it. And this is how we teach the people around us to, to self-regulate. So co-regulation is a key to learning because relationship is the fastest path to self-regulation. Having a connection with someone, feeling understood, feeling like they get, they know what you're feeling is the quickest path to helping someone learn how to regulate. Co-regulation is a warm and responsive interaction. So it is an understanding, it's providing support, coaching and modeling, and it's basically letting the person know what you're feeling is important, I'm listening and you are seen. And I like this visual because again, I like to put these visuals in my head when I'm having difficulties doing what needs to be done, that when their storm, so when a kid is dysregulated, meets our calm, co-regulation occurs. And that's how we, we help calm the waves is we, we provide that for them and we sort of sail together. And co-regulation offers external support to scaffold the development of self-regulation skills. So it's very much like when we're teaching our kids to walk or if we're teaching them to eat or if we're teaching them to read, we don't just put things in front of them and say, hey, do this. We break it down, we show them, we model it, we make mistakes with them, we show them it's okay to make mistakes and learning self-regulation is very similar. By teaching them this way, by allowing them to make mistakes, by modeling our own imperfections, it allows us to promote self-efficacy and allow kids and youth to feel secure enough to practice new skills and to learn from, from their mistakes. We want them to try new strategies. We want them to, when we want them to try strategy, we also want them to, to have the okay to make a mistake with that. And we're talking a lot about the idea of co-regulation and foundations, and there haven't been a lot of strategies discussed, but that's because this actually is the most important part. We could have one strategy, two strategies for, for calming ourselves down, but it is the, the relationship and the co-regulation process that happens that actually helps to solidify these skills. And I like this quote because it helps remind me in the moment that really we want kids to absorb the idea of how they can self-regulate. That there isn't a step-by-step -step program to teach kids these things that it is really a process. It's a process of making mistakes. It's a process of helping them feel understood. It's a process of modeling ourselves and how we're not perfect. And that's how kids absorb the, the ability to eventually do this for themselves. So how do we co-regulate? So I said it's not step by step, but there is a bit of a process and there's some things that we can think about. A lot of what I'm going to talk about now is based off the idea of mirror neurons. And I won't go too deeply into them, but if you're interested, there's, there's a lot of really good videos uh, on them. But mirror neurons are a type of brain cell that respond to what's sort of happening around us. So when we witness someone pick up a glass of water and take a drink, we can often feel in us that sort of sense of relief or what it feels like to drink water. Those are our mirror neurons at work. And we can use this science um, similarly for when we're teaching our kids how to regulate. So if we can be a calm, regulated presence when our child or someone else is dysregulated, and there are ways to do it that, that, that work and that don't, but if we can truly have a calm nervous system, their nervous system will pick up on that. And I think most of us have experienced times where we've walked into a room and you just had this feeling that something has just happened and there's something going on. Those are our mirror, system, mirror neurons so we're at work. So we want to use those to help, to help our kids learn. And the three ways of co-regulating is we want to be attuned, we want to be curious, and we want to be validating. And I'll go through all three of those steps separately. Okay, so being attuned is recognizing and engaging with someone's emotional state. As parents or as caregivers, many of us are already quite attuned to our kids. We have an idea of what they're going to be like when they get up in the morning. We have an idea of possibly what they're going to be like when they come home from school. We know what they look like when there's been an off day. We have ideas of what they look like when they're stressed. We have an idea of what causes certain feelings. For myself, I have to be very careful to not assume, but I have ideas. You want to stay attuned. You want to have an idea that something is kind of happening. We want to notice nonverbal cues, have ideas of 
when our kid is not offering eye contact or when they're starting to slam things down, that that's giving us some kind of information about what's going on inside of them. We're often very attuned to babies. We don't ask them, why are you crying? What's going on? We pay attention and we say, well, when they start sucking on their hand, we know that they're hungry. When they start sucking on their thumb, I think they're getting tired. Um, and this is kind of what we want to do for everybody is just be attuned and have an idea of what's going on internally for them. Then we want to be curious. So again, when we're attuned, we can notice that something is off. For example, um, my teenager comes upstairs in the morning, isn't really talking when she's quite chatty. Um, she doesn't want to eat when she normally has breakfast. Uh, she's being quite short with me when I ask questions, so I'm attuned and I know that something feels a bit off. Then I, then I get curious. And we want to be careful when we're being curious. We don't want to fire lots of questions at anybody because they'll feel like they're being interrogated. And often, if we remember the brain, it, when we're dysregulated, our brain is not online well and lots of verbal input can keep us offline and it can feel even more uh, dysregulating because we, we can't organize it or, or think properly. So we want to be quietly curious sometimes. So we want to listen to what they're saying. So my kid can say, oh, that's so much work to do. Um, and I can be quietly curious about, oh, do you have, does there stuff to do at work at school today? Is there something that you're finding particularly difficult? Knowing what language would help for them. You can wonder with them if they're just saying things like, I'm just so frustrated and I don't know why. That's where we can start taking educated guesses. Like, you know, I noticed that, um, you had your friends over last night and there was a bit of bickering. I'm wondering if, if that's still weighing on you. Is, could that be a possibility? I like to actually use the word curious and say things like, I'm curious, I wonder, to show that I'm thinking and I'm, and I'm and sort of problem solving, not even problem solving, but, but looking critically at a situation because ultimately we want our kids to learn how to do that too. Often even as adults, even as a therapist who talks about feelings all day, I'll be feeling off and it takes a little bit for me to figure out what's exactly going on. And, and I want to, to build that curiosity and wonder in my child. And we also want to authentically label our own feelings. Um, so if it's something between you and your kids, so an example for my family would be a messy room. Um, if, if she's sort of throwing stuff around and she's upset and I'm feeling frustrated because her room's messy and it was supposed to be clean, I can label my feeling and say, I'm feeling really frustrated right now, or I'm not feeling my best right now. And that's modeling to them to sort of check in with them and label it. We're not going to have a kid see us say, oh, I'm feeling frustrated. And then the kids say, wait a second, let me reflect on what's going on. But even if we're modeling it, even if they're not doing it right there, they're taking in that information and new connections are being made that this is what they can do in that moment. And then validating is a key part to co-regulation and it can seem like this is coddling and I want to make it very very clear that this is not coddling that validating is about showing that you acknowledge and accept that that is what the child is feeling and the reality is is even if we don't think they should be feeling that even if we think they are being over dramatic or they're they're wrong in their feelings it doesn't matter because the reality is, is that's how they're feeling. And us telling them you're, you shouldn't feel this way. You don't need to feel this way. Doesn't help in that moment. We need to let them know that it makes sense to us that they are feeling that way. So this can look like us saying, you're really frustrated. You feel like your friends don't like you. And that is, that is sad. Or maybe you are feeling sad. You feel like your friends don't, don't like you. And that would make you feel sad. So even if I think that's not true that her friends don't like her in that moment, that's what she's experiencing. And in order for us to connect, she needs to feel like she's being heard. So I would never validate something that isn't true. So if um, you have a, a, a child who's upset because they didn't hand in one of their book reports at school, I would never say it is unfair that you got a bad mark and you didn't hand it in. That is unfair because it, it's not actually, it makes complete sense. But I can say it, it, it can be really discouraging when you get a bad mark because that's the truth. So it's not about agreeing or disagreeing. It's just about seeing and, and acknowledging their experience. And I think all of us, if we really think about it, can think about a time where we were frustrated. Maybe it didn't make sense. Maybe we were confused and we just had someone that said to us, it makes sense. I can see why you're the way you feel that way. 
and you, you feel seen and validated and you know how much that ends up calming you down. And because I'm an occupational therapist, I needed to add a little bit about play and playfulness in here. Play is important. Playfulness is important. So having a relationship of play and playfulness with your child can actually help their brain to relax. And when our brain relaxes, we connect easier. Um, playing with them. So if they are dysregulating, if they are dysregulating, playing with them, if they can handle some jokes, joking with them, you need to know, you need to know your audience, but being familiar, saying, you know what, I know that you really love, um, you really love this game. Why don't we play this game and we'll talk about this in a little bit. Connecting with them through playfulness helps the brain to relax. It is not coddling. It's not rewarding them for any behavior. It is just one of the best ways that kids can regulate themselves. So putting it all together can seem confusing and detailed, but it, it's actually not. But there are a few things that we can think about. We want to think about our facial expression and our tone of voice. So if we have a child whose toy who's just broken and we know why it broke, us saying, yeah, it totally doesn't make sense that you stepped on your toy and it broke. That's not going to help them with regulation. We want to say things like, I can see you're upset. You like that toy. So being mindful of, of what our voice sounds like. We also want to be organized. So much of teaching self-regulation is about proactive strategies, knowing ahead of time what we what what is helpful. So if we have a child who, when they have to do a presentation at school, consistently becomes quite dysregulated and stressed about it, we can start teaching them. Okay, on Wednesday you have you're doing this presentation. You know we we know from past that that you often have a hard time sleeping that night before that that often you get quite worried. I'm wondering if there's things that we can do ahead of time. Some of the things will vary from kid to kid, but some of those things are having everything laid out in the morning so we're not adding any extra mental load to anybody's plate. It could be practicing a few times helps them in the morning, but setting it up so that they know what they need to do so that they're almost circumventing some of the stressful things that cause them stress. And a lot of this, adults do it naturally. So when I wake up on a work day, and I'm late and I haven't had my coffee and I only get a quick shower, I'm in a very different mental state when I get to work. I know that from my self-regulation, having half an hour to read, have a quiet coffee, have my stuff ready to go, have my lunch ready to go, that all helps me ease into my day. And those are life skills that we can teach our kids. So that instead of me getting to work stressed and having to figure out like, how am I gonna calm myself down so I can get stuff done? I've sort of paved the way so that my nervous system is regulated. If we are dealing with a very dysregulated child, we want to focus on connecting and giving them a way out. Even as adults, I know I can get wrapped up in a situation where I'm frustrated. I will end up saying things I regret. I will possibly do things I regret and it just spirals. So saying, you know, if, if your child breaks their toy and they're dysregulated and we say, if you break another thing, then you're not going to have any toys left. Or if you break one more thing, then you're not going to your play date this afternoon. That doesn't connect and it doesn't give them a way out. Connecting can look like remembering them. So that's my favorite sentence to remember when I'm trying to connect with a very dysregulated child is to think of a way to connect so that they know I know them. So saying things like, I remember that you really like mint tea. If I make you a tea right now, why don't we just sit down and have a, have a break? Or a younger kid, I know you really liked your stuffed animal. Why don't we go grab that and sit on the couch and, and settle with it for a little bit? So connecting with them in a way that they know you know them deeply can help with that regulating and connecting part so that they can get to their thinking part. Touch and physical proximity can, have, can play a big role in co-regulation. Some kids love to have an adult next to them feeling calm, rubbing their back calmly, just being a calming presence. I'm often very mindful of my breath when I'm, when I'm with a kid that enjoys this sort of thing. I'm breathing deeply. I'm, I'm hoping to get their mirror neurons regulating and doing the same thing as I am. Some kids cannot tolerate touch when they are dysregulated and we have to be mindful of that. So going into touch a kid or offering a hug if that is not their thing can just make things worse. But being mindful of how close you are to them and touch can be helpful. Don't assume that you know everything that's going on. So for example, um, I worked with a child who every day after school got off the bus, 
really upset, like stormed into the house, threw down their stuff and, and went up to their bedroom. We all had guesses as to what was happening. Maybe there was someone on the bus that wasn't, um, that, that, that wasn't being very kind to them. Maybe school had been really stressful and they were just done. We had lots of guesses, but we want to be curious about what's actually going on with them. And by spending time with this kid and becoming curious about why they, this was consistently happening, we actually found out that it wasn't anything to do with school. It was coming home and it was the expectation of doing a certain chore when they got home. And that was, it was an easy thing to fix. But if we had taken guesses, we would never have been able to problem solve the actual problem. So hearing the underlying story and not assuming that you know what's going on is an important part too for helping kids to regulate. And we want to help them end the dysregulation and to let go of shame. So how we do that again is very different. I'm going to go through a few sort of body strategies for calming kids, but helping them to dysreg or to, to calm down or to manage their feelings or to to do what they need to do in that moment and then not shaming them for it is an important thing. So we, like I mentioned before, we often say things that we regret. So we don't want to bring that up in the moment. It's too bad that you told, you know, said the F word to mom while you were doing that because now there's going to be a consequence. None of that is helpful in that moment. doesn't mean you're not going to discuss it later if that's important. But in that moment, we want to just basically say, we all get upset. We all do things we regret. You know, you don't, need to feel ashamed of this, we're going to keep working on this together. And that will give the kid the freedom to make mistakes and then know that they can keep trying rather than to turn to masking or holding in feelings because they're afraid of what's going to happen. All right, I can't keep going on without talking about this part as well. I talk about staying calm, being present, being curious, and that's important but it also requires a lot of work on our part to self-regulate because when our kid is doing something that frustrates us, we are human and we're going to feel frustrated. So this can't be about expecting yourself to be calm all the time and that perfect patient parent, because none of us are, we are human. And I think we need to, well, we do need to be mindful of our own state of regulation. I have found that this book is actually a really great, easy read. It's got a number of podcasts if you look it up as well about how to manage our own stress cycle. Because if we are going to model for our kids taking care of stress or, co or regulating, um, using strategies to help ourselves, we need to be able to do them. And we need to be mindful that, that we need to take care of ourselves. Self-care is not the big, you know, like spa days, taking a full day off work. While those things can be helpful, it's the little daily self-care routine, the little things that we put in that are, that are consistent and that are easily done that are actually the ones that work best because they don't require that we take a ton of time off or spend a lot of money. So I'd mentioned before that some of my ways to regulate is just I have tea on hand and if I'm feeling like I just can't get my brain connected, sitting down and reading something enjoyable that I find enjoyable, someone else may not, I don't need their opinions, what works for me in that moment is just 10, 15 minutes of reading. For some people, it's a small little walk. For some people, it's talking to a friend. For others, it might be taking time by yourself. Figuring out what works to help regulate your nervous system is important and making sure that you don't take into judgments what other people think is important is, is what works. So for some people, scrolling on Facebook is very calming and very regulating. For other people, it makes them too frustrated. So knowing what works for you is important. And this book can be helpful um, with learning a bit more about that so that we're able to model it for our kids. Sensations that calm the nervous system. So when our child is dysregulated or having a hard time with self-regulation, there are certain things that we can help guide them towards doing that may help them in that moment to reconnect the thinking part of their brain. In general, slow, rhythmic, linear movement that's continuous is very calming to the system. Things like rocking in a rocking chair or the things that we do with babies, bouncing them, swaying back and forth, rocking them. Those things that we did with, with babies are in general very calming to the system and can still be used for, for kids now or for ourselves. So an example of that would be if your child does like to be hugged, um, rocking with them while you're hugging them or having them use a rocking chair when they're feeling frustrated um, or sitting on a therapy ball and bouncing rhythmically. 
Deep pressure and muscle work is another way of calming the nervous system. And this is muscle work is anything really that, that uses the muscles. Stretching is an excellent way because stretching, if you think about it, helps us when we're tired. If we wake up and we stretch, it kind of wakes us up. And if we're feeling anxious and we stress, we're, and we stretch, it calms us down. So if we can encourage our kid to stretch while they're feeling dysregulated, and again, it. It, you learn how to sort of read your child and come up with tricks for doing things. I, I wouldn't say to a kid, hey, you know, why don't we do a stretching program right now while you're upset? But we might you know, get them to copy what we're doing and to see if we can help regulate their system. Um, with older kids, I will sometimes use kettlebells and just have them lift heavy things because it helps them to calm. Sweet tastes and scents that are familiar, uh, that bring back good memories, uh, can also be helpful for, for calming, our, calming ourselves down when we... Um, when we're feeling dysregulated. It is very individualized what works for us, which is why it would be important to maybe explore some of these things with your kid ahead of time. Like what does help you? What does feel good for your body when you're feeling really tense or when you're tired or when you're shut down? What, what works for you so that you know what to guide them to do when they're dysregulated? Because while they may know when they're calm what they need to do, and, and most of the kids I've worked with can show me deep breathing, can show me lots of strategies when they're calm, but the problem is that when they're dysregulated, they don't have access to the thinking part of their brain where they know this stuff, so they need us to guide them. So knowing ahead of time can be helpful. All right, so we've talked about the theory of what should we do when, when our child is dysregulated, and I'm going to show a couple of videos in a bit about sort of a, a you know, effective way and an ineffective way of doing it. But I also know that in the moment, if our child is dysregulating or child that we're working with is dysregulating, knowing what might work to just help bring things down so that we can connect with them uh, can be helpful. So in the moment strategies that can work are based on our nervous system. So as with the flip the lid model, we are dysregulated, our brain is flipped. These help to reconnect the brain. That's the way I like to describe them. So we think about them in terms of tip. So temperature, cold water on the face, which is something that, that many people naturally do just to sort of regulate themselves, actually sets off something called the dive reflex. When we put cold water or cold ice packs on our face and we lean forward, it really helps to, to set this off. And the dive reflex is when our body goes into to cool water, our nervous system thinks, oh, I'm not gonna be able to breathe. I'm going to have to save my energy and it naturally slows down our breathing, slows down our heart rate and naturally helps our brain to reconnect without us having to think. It just, it, it happens neurologically. So again, that, there are videos online if you want to look that up, but having a kid put a cold face cloth on or even walking outside in the cold can just help to regulate things. Intense exercise can also help and intense means like short, fast bursts. And I've seen parents do this naturally before where they've got a kid that's dysregulated and they will say, I want you to run to the end of that, the parking lot and run back as fast as you can. This is actually an excellent way to help get the nervous system back on track because in order to do that, then in order to do that intense burst of energy, the, the breathing needs to become regulated, the muscles need to become organized and it helps to set everything back and reconnect the brain. Paced breathing is another one I would Unless it's been agreed upon with the child, I would advise against saying, let's do some deep breathing together because most people do not react well when they're dysregulated and someone asks them to do that. But if a child finds breathing helpful, going through boxed breathing with them, um, which is you know breathing in for four, hold for four, breathe out for four, hold for four, breathe it, and it, it's, it's like this. And there's a number of videos on YouTube if you just put in box breathing kids, there's a number of videos that come up. And then progressive muscle relaxation, which is where you squeeze and let go. And this is an easy one to model for the kid as well. If you want to just say, let's, you know, let's squeeze the baseball as, far, as hard as you can and let go, it helps to, um, to release and, and to, to get your neurological system to regulate again or your nervous system to regulate again. A lot of it is about modeling. So even with the breathing, if I'm not telling you child, hey, do breathing with me, I will be sitting next to them and paying attention to my breathing and see if they will copy it. Or I will hold their hands and I will 
actively breathe with them and, and it then helps them to regulate. So those are four ways that in the moment can help to reconnect the brain so that you can talk a bit more. Yes, what's going on, honey? He stepped on my phone and broke my phone! Who stepped on your phone? My brother! Okay, but, honey, where was your phone? It was right here! R right here on the floor? Yeah, but that's not the problem, it's no. broken! But remember how I've asked you oh, many, many, many times to actually put your phone away when you're not using it? Yeah, but that doesn't matter! It matters is that my phone is broken and I can't use it! No, but it kind of does, because I can't help but notice, actually, that not only is your phone on the floor, but so is your game. And I told you Okay, as you can see in that video, the thing I like to point out is that mom's not actually yelling. So many of us have gone into situations like this thinking, I was calm, I was understanding, and they still weren't calming down. The things that were happening in this video that were unhelpful was that the, the feeling was not being labeled at all. We were looking at just what happened. So when she was upset, the little girl was upset, what needed to happen in that moment was for the mom to connect and to say, oh, you're upset. Oh, your phone is broken. Oh, I would be upset too if my phone was broken. Tell me more about what happened. So connecting and being curious. What was happening here is they were, mom went immediately to problem solving, which your phone was on the floor. Of course, someone's gonna step on it if the phone's on the floor. And if you remember the hierarchy, the child needs to be regulated, related, and then they can problem solve. So mom was trying to problem solve up here, trying to explain what happened when the kid had no access to the thinking part of their brain in that moment. And you could see she, re she, she dysregulates even more because she's just trying to get her, her point across. I also wanna say that everything that mom said is true and valid. Phone shouldn't have been on the phone, on the floor. It was a mess. There was of course a big chance that someone was going to step on it. All of that is really valid and worth discussing later if need be. But in that moment, none of that is going to be helpful to help the child to dysregulate. What I actually think is happening in this video is that the kid is trying more and more to have mom see how upset they are feeling. So now we'll watch a, a, a redo of that where mom uses some of the strategies we talked about in, in the uh, presentation. Mom! Yeah, what's going on, honey? You stepped on my phone and now it's broken! What happened, sweetheart? It, the phone was floor and then oh. you stepped on it. I know, that's really, really, really upsetting, right? Yeah, Have but somebody... now I can't use it anymore and I want, wanted to call my friend. Oh, I knew you wanted to call your friend. All right, so maybe could we try something a different way to get in touch with your friend? I don't know, but even then my phone is broken and I can't use it anymore. I know, sweetie. I know, that is so upsetting. I would be really, really upset if my phone was broken too. Okay, and I will point out with these videos that it is easier to role play being calm and doing this. So that's the thing about videos and role play is that they're not real life, but we can pick out what the good things were in that. The mom immediately came down to her level, was, was paying attention to proximity. When you stand above someone like this, there's a, the, the child can feel like it threatened in a way. So mom came down, mom heard what she was saying. She validated that it is upsetting when you break your phone. Oh, now you can't call your friends. That's really tough. And if you'll notice, she actually, mom actually went in to touch her and, and you could see from the kid's uh, body language that she did not want to be touched in that moment. And mom respected that and just sat back. And the other thing mom did really well was when the little girl tossed the game, mom ignored that for now. If mom had said, you don't need to be throwing around your toys, I'm trying to hold your hand and help you here, all of that would have um, dysregulated her even more. So in that moment, we saw some really good proximity and, and being aware, aware of physical touch. Mom was curious, tell me more about this. Mom was validating of the feelings and, and mom remained calm herself. So that's the beginning. And then what could happen there is we would want Maybe mom has talked with the kid beforehand about what helps um, and then they do some deep breathing together or going for a walk or maybe playing a game. And then if there are things that need to be problem solved, like you know, how are we gonna get the phone fixed? What's our plan? That can be done once the child is more regulated. I'm a big fan. If we have kids that really have difficulties with regulation, I like to wait well outside of the context of the problem to do any problem solving so that they're regulated, they're in a better space, and that, that they, they can access their, their thinking. 
that is co-regulation and the teaching of self-regulation in a very you know, short amount of time. And the next steps in sort of what to do after this would be to think about your own and your child's regulation needs and to understand and validate your own. What do you need in order to help them learn and to not invalidate yourself? So if you are someone that needs a lot of extra space or needs alone time so that you are in the space that you can help your child, that's important. And that's something that, that you can start sort of problem solving for yourself. We want to approach dysregulation with attunement, curiosity, and validation. And we have to know that we're not going to be perfect at it. I teach this all day and there are days where I fail miserably at it. And it's actually okay because I'm modeling for my kid that none of us are perfect. We're going to make mistakes. It doesn't mean we just give up. It means we try to do better next time. Or we figure out why we, why we messed up and we problem solve around that. We want to remind ourselves that when we are dysregulated or our child is dysregulated, we do not have access to our best parts. So we will not be able to pick a strategy. They will not be able to, to you know, do the deep breathing like they were taught in their class. Their brain is flipped that we want to help them reconnect. And we want to explore regulation strategies with our kid when they're calm. That's the best time to learn. Um, I like to think about it like, like it's a sport. So we would never put our kids on the soccer field and say, go score goals, play a game, do it at game time. There's practice, there's drills, all of that stuff happens outside of the stress of a game. And that's kind of what we want our kids to do with regulation strategies too, is to practice it outside of the game of dysregulation so that when they're in that the dysregulation, it almost becomes an automatic where they're like, wait a second, I've practiced this so much, I know what I need to do. And remembering that this is going to be a process. There are going to be days where kids do it really well and we do it really well and days that we don't do it really well. That's, that is normal and, and it will probably be like that for forever. We are all always practicing. And we want to remember that we are self-regulation is something we do with someone, not to someone. So it's a process. It's a collaboration. It's, it's working with our kids so that they feel connected and heard. I really like this quote from Stephen Porges, that safety is much more than the absence of threat. Safety is the presence of connection. We are best at regulating when we feel safe and connected. So if we focus on creating a feeling of safety and being connected with the people that we that around us, that is where we will then be sort of setting the stage for self-regulation skills to be learned. That's where they will learn it's okay to make mistakes. That's where they will learn deep breathing helps me in those moments. But until we have that safety and connection, those skills won't be able to be learned. Go. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about a number of the things that we talked about, here's a list of resources and you can dig deeper there. I'd also like to warn people that this stuff is constantly being researched and updated. And it's actually been one of the most exciting parts about the 19 years that I've worked in this field. I have learned so much from my colleagues and the social workers and the psychologists and the psychiatrists that I've worked with and the other occupational therapists. And we are constantly learning and changing how we approach things. So while this is relevant right now, likely if you watch this a few times, there's going to be some new information that could have been added. So I'd like you to sort of continue to explore and, and to, to learn about co-regulation and to be mindful that, that likely there's more than what's been in this video. So thank you very much. And I wish you luck with your co-regulation journey.